There are special spots in space that are particularly appealing for sending satellites and telescopes to. These are called Lagrange points, and specifically here we're talking about the Earth-Sun Lagrange points. There are five of them, named L1 to L5, but one of them in particular has a lot of important telescopes at it right now. L2 is currently home to four world-leading telescopes, with a combined value of at least $13 billion. One question that I've been asked quite a lot is, given that the Lagrange points are technically infinitesimally small, how can we safely send four different telescopes to that same spot in space? So, what are Lagrange points, and why are they so special? Before we get into the details of all of this, I want to just give you the headlines, just in case you want to take that and get on with your day without needing too many details. So here goes. The Lagrange points themselves are tiny, single points in space, but the telescopes aren't just parked directly at those points, but they're actually on enormous orbits around them. For example, both JWST and Euclid are on orbits, which means that they spend almost all of their time further from L2 than the Moon is from the Earth. These wide orbits are especially stable, meaning the telescopes can spend minimal fuel to maintain them, and they would in theory stay there for years, even with no maintenance. The next question is, is there any risk of collision between the telescopes? And luckily, there's essentially zero chance of that. While the orbits of the telescopes are similar, they're offset by plenty. And for example, JWST and Euclid regularly have distances between them of over a million kilometers. And as far as I can see, there's no point in the next few years that they'll ever be closer than 500,000 kilometers. So assuming there's no strange error, Collisions or even getting in each other's images are incredibly unlikely. Okay, so I think those are the main points, so let's now dig a little deeper into some of those things. First of all, why Lagrange points are even special? Why are there points of relative stability out in space? Well, they occur in any two-body system, and in this case, it's the Sun and Earth. The Lagrange points are points nearby, where forces combine just right to create an equilibrium point. If there was a small body, like a telescope or satellite, also hanging around near the Sun and Earth, then this small body would naturally end up orbiting with those bodies too. Since the Sun is so much more massive than the Earth, this telescope would effectively end up orbiting the Sun. The dominant forces then acting on that small body, like the telescope, will be gravitational forces from the Sun and the Earth, and also the centrifugal force that the telescope, or whatever it is, feels as it orbits the Sun. Anything moving in a circular path feels this outward force. Just imagine being on a roundabout, and you feel a force pushing you away from the centre of that roundabout. That is the centrifugal force, and it's no different here the telescope would also feel this outward force on this stellar roundabout. It turns out there are a few places in this system where the outward centrifugal force perfectly balances with the inward tug of the combined gravitational forces that the telescope would feel from the Sun and Earth. To be precise, there are five points where this balance happens, and these are the five Lagrange points, named after the famous French-Italian mathematician Joseph-Louis Lagrange. Of course, there are other bodies involved too, such as the Moon, also exerting gravity gravitational forces on objects in this vicinity. These forces, though, are way smaller than that of the Sun and Earth, so for simplicity, it's perfectly safe to ignore their influence here. When we send telescopes to these points, they don't sit exactly at those points but rather they orbit them. They're usually set on paths called Lissajou orbits, or on halo orbits, which are just a periodic version of a Lissajou orbit. These are quasi-periodic orbits around a Lagrange point that involve minimal propulsion to maintain. This is perfect for telescopes and satellites, which are always trying to save as much fuel as they can so that their mission can last as long as possible, since there's no refueling this deep in space. For L1, L2, and L3, the Lagrange points are actually unstable, meaning that if you aren't perfectly on the point, then the spacecraft will slowly drift away from them over time, meaning it is always necessary to use some fuel to stay near them. It's like being at the top of a perfectly pointy mountain. You can stay there if you're exactly on the tip, but any small step away from that will send you tumbling down the mountain. Or it's like balancing a perfectly pointy pencil on its tip. In theory, if you got it perfect, it should stay there forever. But any deviation away from perfectly vertical and it will come crashing down. On the other hand, L4 and 5 can be stable. More like sitting at the bottom of a valley. A small step away could take you up the hill, but with no other forces, you'll eventually slide back down to the bottom of the valley. Despite the stability of L4 and L5, they tend 
to be much less useful spots for spacecraft. For telescopes, L2 is definitely the most interesting one though. So let's look at the specifics of that one last. Firstly, we have L1, which is in between the Sun and the Earth. Just like the Earth, each Lagrange point orbits the Sun, as the gravitational pull from the Earth moves. L1 is particularly good for placing solar observatories, because they get an unobstructed view of the Sun. Currently, the European Space Agency's Solar and Heliospheric Observatory, SOHO, is in a halo orbit around L1, along with two NASA missions, ACE and WIND, that study solar winds. There's also the DISCOVER Observatory, which is actually pointed at the Earth, to take sunlit photos of our planet, reminiscent of the famous blue marble image, taken on the Apollo 17 mission in 1972. L3 is definitely the most useless of the points for our needs at the moment. It's pretty much perfectly opposite the Earth on the other side of the Sun, although it is very slightly further from the Sun than the centre of the Earth. Nothing is there, we don't use it, let's move on. L4 and L5 form equilateral triangles, with the Earth and Sun as the other corners, and they at least have slightly more interesting force diagrams, where the gravitational forces add up to counteract the centrifugal forces. There are a few asteroids that have found their ways into these locations as they are stable points, but no human-made spacecraft are at either at the moment. In the future, we will be sending the space-based gravitational wave detector LISA to L5, and actually a Pathfinder test mission for this actually went to L1 a few years ago, but that's it for now for L4 and 5. L2 though is getting busy, and has been home to many missions in the past, despite being 1.5 million million kilometres from Earth in the opposite direction of the Sun. This spot is so great, because one sun shield can block light from the Sun, Earth and Moon all at the same time, helping to reduce invading light when these telescopes are trying to take images of incredibly distant and faint cosmic objects out in space, and also helping to keep the telescopes and their instruments incredibly cold often down to just a few Kelvin above absolute zero. Currently, as I film this, there are four telescopes at L2. The $10 billion Infrared Observatory JWST, two ESA missions called Gaia and Euclid, which are mapping Milky Way stars and mapping over a billion galaxies respectively, and also a German-Russian collaboration called SPECTRE-RG. This last one is the most mysterious to me. I can't find any specific orbital data on it to tell you about here, and it's been largely inactive since the Ukrainian war began, so let's focus on the other three for now. Is there any concern at all that these three world-leading telescopes could get too close to each other, collide, or even just ruin each other's images? Luckily, not at all. The orbits that each one is on are so wide that it's been easy to keep the telescopes very far apart. JWST and Euclid especially are on enormous orbits that are wider than the orbit of the Moon around the Earth. These wide orbits are the most stable, requiring less fuel to maintain than a smaller orbit would. Also, the orbits of these telescopes can't be in the shadow of the Earth for too long, otherwise the solar-powered systems on board would run out. So a wide orbit keeps the power topped up too, as it keeps the telescope in direct sunlight. It is slightly ironic that one side of the telescope needs sunlight and the other side needs to be dark and cold, but these are the parameters we have to work with here. As you can see in this gorgeous two-scale simulation done by a piece of software called Gaia Sky, the Gaia telescope is on a smaller orbit than the other two telescopes. As far as I understand, this is mostly to aid in how Gaia maps the stars in our galaxy, but even this orbit is absolutely enormous. All of this means there's always plenty of distance between all of the telescopes, and chances of collisions are effectively non-existent. While it has been possible to briefly see one telescope scope from another, for example, here is a Gaia image of JWST. This is definitely not a regular problem for the images they're taking of the universe, and we're not expecting to see Euclid photobombing JWST anytime soon. Also, you can see just how small JWST looks in the image here, demonstrating again the huge distances between them all. There have also been a bunch of other cool missions at L2 in the past. Interestingly, the Wind spacecraft visited here before heading to L1, but my personal favourite past missions have to be the Cosmic Microwave Background Mappers WMAP and Planck. This last one, Planck, even got its temperature down to an incredible 0.1 Kelvin, which made it the coldest known object in space from 2009 to 2012 when its cooling system turned off. 
At the end of missions like this, we want to remove the spacecraft from the vicinity of L2 just to keep it tidy and safe. So the crafts tend to use the last of their fuel to move themselves into heliocentric orbits where they can go to sleep and calmly and passively orbit the sun until the end of days. There are also a load of future missions planned to go to L1 and L2 in the future, but I guess the most exciting upcoming one for me will be the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope, launching in a few years and heading to join the party at L2. That's it for now, but let me know if you have any questions or comments down below, and thanks for watching. Until next time, stay safe team. I'll see you soon. Bye!